Uh, we are joined right now by a, a near and dear person um, who's here uh, wearing her hat as the uh, racial justice manager at the Evanston YWCA. Welcome, Eileen Heineman. Thank you very much. And it's an here. honor to have you here. And I just got to tell both everyone listening in that Katie Hogan, my co-host, and Eileen are sisters. It's true. It's true. She's and they, I, whoever that family of yours forged some great social justice activist types. Amen. Thank and you. So Thank now you, you're Mom at the YWCA, which has uh, always been a little more progressive than the YMCA, and uh, well, we like are, to say both of us do good work. We, I love you both. <laughs> I love both of the YWCA and the YMCA. Michael is like the most dedicated Y goer I know. Well, the Y is actually calling itself the Y now, trying to get rid of the men's and the Christian part, I guess, in the slogan. Well, uh, in, place, in places where both exist, it's important to have the YM and the YW. So, so tell us about the Evanston YWCA. <clears throat> well, the Evanston YWCA has existed for almost 80 years and is part of the National YWCA organization, which yeah. a few years ago, about 10 years ago actually, uh, cha changed its brand and decided to have eliminating racism and empowering women as its slogan, its, its import, mission. its mission, uh, because they realized that all of the work that they've been doing since they started uh, shortly after the Civil War has been about that. That. It started because of the civil rights movement. It, the, the one in Evanston actually in its original form uh, was a place where the women who were working as domestics in the large houses along the lakefront could spend their day off because there was nowhere that these women of color could go during the day. They weren't welcome anywhere and so that's where they would go and play cards with each other and chat with each other on their day off. And that's the local history. That's the local Where does the YWCA start? Uh, it started out east, and I don't have all of that at my fingertips. I have mine at my fingertips. I'm well, going to bring good. you back local. Okay. With, just because you went that far, and that made me tear up. Um, it, it is. It, it, uh, that response is how I felt. That's I'm, great. I did not grow up. As, as you know, I didn't grow up with YW or YMCA. Right. We didn't have that on the south side. and so On the southwest side. On the southwest side. So completely new to me. But was, you probably had a CYO. We no. Had, we no, had, you didn't have that either? We had a little Catholic bit of CYO Uthers. basketball, but oh. not, not in terms not of gym. social yeah. justice kind of thing and not a particularly dedicated building. Yeah. And so for me to be a person who has lived and worked in Evanston, Skokie, Rogers Park for 30 years and not know that this organization and provides shelter for women and children from domestic abuse uh, and is one of three shelters in the entire north and northwest suburbs. There are only three. Evanston, Arlington Heights, and Waukegan are three places for women to go. None in Chicago. Then there are no, there no. are about oh, there are. Okay. but there are only about four in well, Chicago. I remember in the entire city there are only about four places for domestic abuse abuse victims to go to sleep at night. And so it's a it's a huge um, it, it's a huge service, service and it, every day there are women that get turned away because these places are filled. So the YWCA's mission is looking at why do we, what does eliminating racism have to do with all of that? Many of the situations that put people into domestic violence, into poverty, into economic distress come from systemic racism. That yep. when you look back, it's that underlying cause that puts people in really desperate situations. So um, I've been hired uh, and I'm happy to be in the position of being the racial justice manager for the Evanston YWCA and we'll be working in the community to get dialogues going so that we can start learning how to talk about racism instead of talk around it. Like you know, I just want to throw this in because uh, going to the Y on a regular basis in Evanston. I go to the McGaw Y and uh it turns out that there was a there were two Y's in Evanston. Yeah. They were segregated, and uh, you know the blacks couldn't go to one. Uh, and what happened recently, to my understanding, was they had a it's a it's somehow connected to a 125 year anniversary of the Y up there. They had uh, people from both Y's from you know like old days. history old people right well, you know well yeah. over maybe middle aged <laughs> I don't know how we're defining that today uh, it's but, a theme but they really have had uh, an effort to to consolidate the two histories and to uh, 
you, you to know, address promote it. it, to address well, it, and talk about there's it. A, there's a wonderful film that was made actually by the, the woman, Susan Hope Engel is a filmmaker and also happens to be the president of the YWCA's board, but in her role as a filmmaker, she interviewed and created a fabulous documentary of that story, and she interviewed the men and women who hung around at, that, at the Emerson Y, is what the original Emerson Y was, y, right. and it was the place for African Americans and Evanston to go to the Y. They were not welcome uh, at the McGaw at that time. And even when the Emerson Y was closed... Which th was when? Which was, I, I believe it was in the early 60s. Okay. They were still... At one, one of the men tells the story, and I, I actually met this man. He, he was a police officer in Evanston at the time, an African American, and he came into the... Um, he came into the McGaw Y and in his uniform, because he felt like that would help to say, okay, I want to join here now, and was told, well, you know, you probably won't be comfortable here. Holy smokes. And that's a man who still lives in Evanston today and tells the story because he came to the filming, the screening of that film that I, that I was at. And it, it's an amazing piece of history because there's, there's stories told in there sort of matter-of-factly by these people who lived through this. At mm. one point, and this was, I, I can't tell you the date, early 50s, I believe, the city of Evanston, feeling proud of itself for deciding to do this, went to some of its um, upper echelon African-American citizens who didn't live in the neighborhood where most of the African-Americans lived. They didn't live in the, what's known as the Fifth Ward, and said, you know, we think you're going to be happier living near your own people, and lifted up their houses and moved them to the Fifth Ward. Holy smokes. Now, that's, that's a story some history. that I had never heard before. Yeah, this about is cutting-edge information. What era? what era? This was, I think, the early 50s. No. And it's an amazing story, and it's an amazing thing to think about Evanston, where you know everyone pats themselves on the back for living in a diverse community. But it's the community where Ricky Birdsong, uh, after whom this race that we're we're going to talk about was it was named Ricky Birdsong, a Northwestern University coach, was walking down the street with two of his children, and was shot by some shot and killed by someone who was the same man who had come here through Rogers Park, shot at people leaving their synagogue, entering their synagogues on a Friday night, drove into Evanston, shot I an African American, day. then drove to Indiana and killed a Korean student. Wasn't at, wasn't at, there one of them in Skokie? One and, of the incidents? It, well, it, it, the Ricky Bird song is right on the border of Evanston oh, okay. and Skokie. Okay. And and this man, he, the man eventually killed himself, and he was a, a, a follower of Matthew Hale, a white supremacist. Guys like that should start with killing. Oh, sorry. And and <laughs> Careful, so Careful, Kate. Rick, Ricky Ricky Bird song's wife, Sherilyn, knew that. What she really wanted was the way to honor his memory was to get people together saying we, we, don't, we cannot tolerate this. And so she began the race against hate. Uh, his his uh, murder happened in 1999 and she began the race the following year on Father's Day as a way to say this is a man who was just walking down the street with his kids being a good dad and we need to all get, get together and say we won't tolerate this anymore. So on, on the same so, weekend, next week, weekend as the Artists Art, of the right. Wall. And you can actually come here on Saturday, paint your square for the Artists of the Wall, <laughs> go and be in the Walker race early Sunday morning and come back here by 10 o'clock in the morning. It's actually a big race. I mean, uh, yeah. it is there big. are people wearing shirts, Race Against Hate, in the Y, working out all the time, I mean, from different years. There's, uh, there'll be about 3,500 people that'll be involved next That's Sunday terrific. morning. And everybody from small children, there's a, there's a kid's mile, and kids from age two on up do that, which is fabulous. Cute. And then lots of different ages involved in the 5K walk. And then there's a 5K and 10K run. And there are actually, uh, it's a timed race, and people get prizes. And, and they have different starts for each of those? And they have, yeah, they have different starts for, for each of those. And, and then people are, it's it happens up on Sheridan Road near the Northwestern campus, and it's it's beautiful. And mm -hmm. then people all gather and hang out in Longfield and celebrate together. And and where exactly is that? Is Longfield it's Sheridan Road up near, uh, at Lincoln Avenue? So it's right, right. across the street from uh, Northwestern the Northwestern campus. You are listening to WLUW 88.7 Chicago Sound Alliance. This is live from the Heartland. I'm Michael James. I'm here with Katie Hogan, and we're speaking with Eileen Heineman. Hogan, who is uh, 
the director of racial justice programming at the YWCA. At the YWCA. Now in Evanston. Now let me ask you, Eileen. Um, this race, uh, there's a new sponsorship. The YWCA is now sponsoring the race. Right. About six years ago, Sherilyn asked if the YWCA would co-sponsor with the Birdsong Foundation because uh, because their missions were so uniquely similar. And um, and then the following year, she handed over the race and the the foundation's treasury at that point to the YWCA because she was going to be moving down to Atlanta and she wanted to be sure that it would be carried out. And she comes back every year for the race, and she'll be here next Sunday. Again. How old are the kids? No. Her youngest, uh, her youngest is uh, 17, uh, 18, and her two do- her two daughters are in their 20s. Well, actually, the, uh, there's a son, Ricky, Ricky Jr., who yeah. uh, was in school with my son Hal. Uh, at the Evanston Y Daycare Center way, way back. I was, I was his principal for his last two years of elementary school. Well, Hal painted a picture, which I have in the back in that junky office you were talking about earlier, Katie. I didn't call it junky. Called Ricky, Ricky at the Beach. Uh. And it's a picture of this kid with kind of a little hat, like almost like a so beret cool. with sunglasses on. It's so a great cool. picture. Yeah, I and I've got to make a copy of that and yeah, get yeah, it to him. It, yeah, give it to me. I'll see her next Sunday. She'll love that. Oh, that's, that's great. That is is very cool. Mm-hmm. Eileen, I'm, I'm so proud of you for doing uh, this work. I'm, I'm proud of both of you. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled <laughs> to be doing this work. I, it's something I have such a passion about the need for dialogue to be happening across cultures, across races. I, I just feel like we, we spend all the time in the world, in our country, talking about race, but not really talking through it. And, well, I've, I've, and it's the root of a lot of our issues. I, I, it's clear, you know, and I... I read this book called Jesse James, The Last Rebel of the Civil War, which was really talks about how Jesse James got recreated in this, uh, you know, good guy outlaw mode when, in fact, his family uh, were slave owners and had st- they uh, raised hemp to bind cotton, went down the Missouri River. Anyhow, the thing that was talked about in that book was how the... Re- Republicans with Reconstruction gave up on Reconstruction, and the nation lost its soul right. back Amen. right after the Civil War. Yep. And I, th- I think it's true that racism is so key to, to many of our ills and our problems, and it is our greatest challenge. But I find that a lot of people think, oh, well, we have a black president, so it doesn't matter. I'm in dialogue with a number of my classmates from 1960 in high school back in Connecticut, and um, a guy wrote back to me, ah, quit playing the race card. You know, there's... But that really fired up other people. Right. It's clear that race is, and racism is rampant. Well, and it's, in, there may be less um, individual, there, there may be fewer people that are personally racist, but we still live in a country that was built on systems created by and for white property-owning property men. That's in the Constitution. That's how our country was formed, and that's how banks were formed, and that's... So all of the systems were built to not include a whole bunch of us, myself included. Um, and because of that, that's, that's where, that's the history. And the, for me, the easiest way to point this out to people when they say, well, I don't get it, I, don't, I, I didn't do that, I, I'm not, I don't do any of those things. 10, 20, whatever it was, 15 years ago, driving across a uh, beautiful country in South Dakota and Wyoming with our kids, we were stunned. It was our first trip like that into that part of the world, seeing the Badlands and uh, all of that for the first time. And, you know, following the map and seeing where we were and boring our kids with whatever, you know, Bob uh, and I would say from the front seat. Well, this is the thing, the biggest thing we all got from it was every time we came to a part of the country that didn't look good, the land was not arable. It was Native American. It was an Indian reservation. The first time I saw that on the map, I said, oh. (laughs) And it happened three more times. Mm -hmm. And by that time, we were stunned. And I didn't do that. I don't like it. I didn't create it. I live in a country that still exists in that way. Even in Ireland. When I was in Ireland, what, what struck me when you were in Ireland, 
there were rocks in the fields everywhere as we were driving. And you got to Northern Ireland, and all of a sudden, the fields were more open. It was just like higher level agricultural district. Right. So we are, we are definitely a more integrated society. We are definitely a, a country where people are more comfortable being in the presence of people of other races. But when it comes right down to it, the majority of America, when you go home at night, or when you go out to dinner on Saturday... Or when you go to church on or, Sunday. That's the most segregated hour in America. But when you are with the people with whom you spend most of your time, you are most likely with people who look and sound like you. And that is a reality in our country because we don't know how to have those conversations. You know, I want to share one other thing that we were talking a little bit history about segregation in the YMCA. Uh, when I was uh, 20 years old and I was going to Lake Forest College, I went to uh, the uh, Waukegan YMCA to check out the weight room and it was all white. And it turned out there was another YMCA, the Genesee Street Branch YMCA in North Chicago, which was the Black Y. And right. this was 1962. I don't know if Genesee Street is still there, but it was clearly that was the Y for the black people. And, and it they was were a probably small lifting place. heavier weights. <laughs> <laughs> Every day. Well, I was the weightlifting instructor with these bed. kids. Yeah, it was just, it really <laughs> hit me how, um, how things were divided back yeah. then. Well, um, it's interesting to have three white people up here talking about racism because actually, in fact, folks, it is a white problem. Well, um, and it's not, racism doesn't just hurt people of color. Racism hurts us. everybody. Absolutely. Everybody. It limits the way we can think. It, it limits pr our perspective. Yeah. And we got some guys who want to come up here yeah, and address and the like, situation. They want to address the situation <laughs> and we're going to let them. Um, let me just uh, reiterate, uh, the Race Against Hate is Sunday, June 19th, next Sunday, and uh, starts at what time? Uh, at various times, the uh, the the 10K starts at 7:30. Um, you have to be there early if you haven't registered yet, but you can register during the week at several places. And you people can go, could on, go online, you can right? Go, yeah, absolutely. At this point, registering online or. Uh, in person are the only things to do. Um, and you can go online to ywcae-ns.org. That's the YWCA Evanston North Dash Shore. North Shore. Or you can just Google Race Against Hate and you'll, you'll get right it. to the place. And it is completely worth being there, even if you're not a person who wants to walk or run. It's worth being there just to see the spirit of the day and to cheer on all of the community members who are out there. This year, um, Three Crowns, one of the senior living places in Evanston, is sponsoring prizes for the uh, for your age group, Michael. For the over 62s, they're going to have the middle um, agers. The uh, yeah, the new middle age. And what, what is 69? The new 49 or something? I don't, I don't know, know, but that's what I am. I know. That's why uh, I Eileen, tell us one more time uh, who Ricky Birdsong was. Ricky and, Birdsong uh, was a Northwestern University coach, um, basketball a basketball coach, uh, dearly beloved, and uh, he and his family lived in Northwest Evanston and he was the victim of a hate crime. Uh, he was shot while out walking um, on a Friday night with his kids, uh, just walking through the neighborhood. Just died on the front lawn of somebody else's house. Um, it, incomprehensible to the whole neighborhood. That community still reels from, from that event. Um, and he lived in a community that was most, and still is, mostly white, but is a neighborhood that, that is integrated and, and, ver and welcoming and uh, and it was Sherilyn Birdsong, a very strong, wonderful woman, who said, uh, the way I'm going to, uh, you know, I could live in grief and anger the rest of my life, or I could honor this man and do something. And so she created this race as a way to say, come on, folks, let's all walk together, show people that we can do things together, and and we still need it. Well, good work, Eileen, and shine on. Uh all, all who take part in the race against hate, whether it's next Sunday or every single day. Go um, for the every single day. Yeah. yeah. Really. All right. Thank let's have much. a big round of applause for Eileen, Eileen Heineman. Heineman.